Hello students of history and welcome back. In this video we'll be looking at the rise of the Empire of Japan and the ways in which uh, these spirit warriors as they saw themselves are going to have a tremendous impact of course in bringing the United States into war following the attack on Pearl Harbor on December the 7th of 1941. So let's start by taking a look at how Japan, after what was called their Meiji Restoration, is going to greatly change their culture and really add to their militarism as well. Because in 1867, the Meiji Restoration is going to take place because the United States of America came in with Matthew Perry and an armada of ships and basically shook Japan to the core. All right, before that time, Japan was a very almost a medieval society in which they had the shogunate, they had the emperor, and they had this idea that anybody that's outside of Japan is is a an outsider that must be kept out completely uh, because they're basically devils. The Japanese had a term called gaishin, and gaishin was a term that meant that everyone who is non-Japanese is a devil. And this is going to be one of the main cultural components of old Japan, pre-1867 Japan. But after 1867, uh, Japan will go through a, basically a revolution in which their whole society starts to change. And they still feel that way about outsiders. They feel still feel in, in many cases that all outsiders are gaijin. But at the same time, there's a new emphasis on Japan being part of the world stage. We'll see them take place on the world stage in World War I, and they were very jaded by the way that they were treated in World War I, because at the Treaty of Versailles, they were really not acknowledged as one of the great powers, even though they contributed both money and men to the war effort, and they were treated uh, poorly because of their non-white status. And so at that point, Japan is going to decide that they must be on the world stage as a great power. And the only way to get people's attention is to be a highly militarized power with technology and an empire. And this is going to get started uh, after World War I. So their social structure after the Meiji Restoration is going to um, be based around the emperor, based upon worship of the emperor. Emperor Hirohito is called the boy emperor because he's uh, a young man when he inherits the throne and he will um, come to the throne in the post-World War I era and oversee much of this massive expansion that's going to take place into Korea, Manchuria, China, and of course bring us into World War II. But the entire social structure is based upon the idea that Japan is heaven on earth. That Japan is as heaven on earth, has a god, and that god is the emperor. And the emperor is the, I mean, the, the embodiment of everything that is Japan's religion. And therefore, the emperor must be protected at all costs. Now, we as patriots here in America have a distinct feeling that, you know, that maybe uh, I, America's the ideal country, that it's a great country, that we love it, for instance. But I, I highly doubt that any of us are looking at our president, current or past presidents, and saying that they are God on earth and that America is sacred soil that is heaven on earth. I mean, that this is taking it to definitely a radical extreme. And in many ways, it's very similar to the hyper-nationalism that we see over in Europe during this time with the fascists and the Nazis. But it, in this case, it's not a political thing. It's a religious thing. It is truly religious. So all of society is geared around this idea of worshiping the emperor and then also preparing militarily to defend Japan at all costs, to defend heaven on earth at all costs. And so this means that Japan is extremely militarized by the time we get into the 1930s and 40s. Since the Japanese are meant to defend their homeland and to defend their emperor at all costs and to give their life for their emperor, uh, they, they felt that the only really good death was to die in battle. That as a military person, or when there is a war going on, the only legitimate death is to die in battle. You can't ever retreat. You can't ever be defeated in battle. You must die for your emperor and for uh, your country. And so they believed themselves to be these spirit warriors. And the idea was that your Yamoto Tamashii was, was held within your liver and that your spirit warrior status was, or your strength came from your liver. And often what the Japanese military did as a, a very war criminal kind of thing to, to do, but during the war in the Pacific, what they did to their enemies is they would often consume their enemies' livers. So the uh, generals, for instance, 
would make it so that uh, in order to like possess the feelings of their their uh, vanquished foes, they would order that um, prisoners that had been taken have their livers removed and cooked up for them. And uh, often commanders would require that their men eat pieces of enemy liver as well to strengthen their Yamoto Damashii. So there's this ancient Japanese term called kamikaze, which goes back to the medieval time period in, in Japanese his history in which there was this navy that was trying to attack from Korea and and they were coming over to attack um, Japan and this kamikaze or this godwind, this hurricane tsunami took place that vanquished their foes, defeated their navy. It happened a couple times throughout Japanese history and so that was se uh, seen as really emboldening the Japanese to believe in this theory of this is heaven on earth and God's wind will come through and protect it at all costs. And so then they will of course use that name for pilots during World War II who are suicide pilots because the idea was that the kamikaze is sent out to protect Japan. And as they did this, they would often be shouting their war cry, which is bonsai. Bonsai, a Japanese term, means another 10,000 years, meaning that as I die for my emperor and for my country, it's guaranteeing another 10,000 years. My suicide is not a suicide. My death is giving life to my emperor and to my country. Again, a very strange idea that is uh, different for us in America today. But the Japanese believed in what they called a cult of death or a Bushido code. The Bushido code was a, an ancient samurai idea in which you cannot retreat. It is, it is um, infamous for your family. It's a, a terrible thing for your family to go through if you're ever uh, seen retreating or if you ever return from battle without being victorious. You cannot be taken prisoner. You cannot be taken alive. You must die a glorious death in battle, shouting bonsai and giving your life for God on earth. So a lot of the material that we're talking about, about today, I, I first discovered when I was reading a book by James Bradley called The Flyboys. And this is a nonfiction book that I think really nicely puts things into perspective here about the mentality of the Japanese as they're about to engage in World War II and how this these cultural ideas that we were just talking about drove them on a path towards destruction, of course, but also they thought, they sincerely believed that they were doing what was right because their culture spans these thousands of years and, and had these ideas there to begin with, but in a way they're, they're actually pretty similar to some of the things that they were witnessing from Western powers in the 19th to 20th century. Because you see, in the 19th and 20th century and, and even further back, as you look at American history, for instance, we had this thing called Manifest Destiny in which th there was this idea that America is, you know, God's chosen people and that they're meant to spread from coast to coast. And millions of Native Americans, uh, Mexicans, um, Hawaiians, millions of people are going to, to face this threat of American expansion and they will be defeated and pummeled and, and forced to assimilate or, you know, be isolated onto reservation system. And the Japanese were watching all of this and saying, you know, we, we have that same idea. We want to do that same thing where everyone else is less than us. And since God is on earth, it's our manifest destiny or what the Japanese would call their Haku Ichiu to spread across the Pacific. So whereas the United States said it was God's gift to America to spread from coast to coast. Essentially, the Japanese are saying the same thing that Haku Chiu says, we're meant to go into Korea. We're meant to go into Manchuria and China and all across the Pacific. And nothing should stand in our way because we're being just like the Americans were. And this really puts us on the road to Pearl Harbor because of these cultural ideas that the Japanese possess, again, that they learned from watching the United States and European powers in the 19th and 20th century. After World War I, Japan was prepared to expand into the territories of Korea, Manchuria, and China because they wanted raw materials. If you look at Japan today, it's uh, not as resource rich as they need it to be in order to um, uh, put themselves on the world stage the way that the United States was, which was their goal. And they were highly dependent upon imports from countries like the United States to provide them with, with oil and uh, the fuel that they needed in order to perpetrate their war machine. So what they did was they decided to go on a rampage throughout uh, Manchuria and Korea and China, taking slaves as they went as laborers and experimentation, but also um, in order to get raw materials. So for instance, in the invasion of Korea, the Japanese are going to take 
tens of millions of people as either slave labor or as what the Japanese military referred to as comfort women. Comfort women were young girls and women that were um, used as sex slaves for the Japanese military and especially for their upper ranking officials, but they would also um, give their men the, the rights to these women as well. So there were hundreds of thousands of women that were, were raped on a daily basis by the Japanese military. And, and as they spread through Korea and then took these tens of millions of people as slave labor, they then went to Manchuria and start, sparked what was known as the Second Sino-Japanese War. So Sino-Japanese meaning war between China and Japan. This is something that they'd done before in the uh, 1890s and early 1900s, and now they're off um, to another attack, which is plan to take as much of China as possible. Again, the Japanese feel totally justified in doing this because they viewed the Chinese and Koreans as gaijin or devils uh, because they were outsiders. And so their plan was to treat them as such uh, through various things like the rape of Nanking. In the rape of Nanking, the Chinese military actually took their, uh, their forces away from the city of Nanking hoping that the Japanese would avoid the city and avoid the civilian population and attack the military instead. But the Japanese decided to attack the city first and kill and rape and burn hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking about 300,000 people that were, that were civilian non-combatants. And the Japanese did things like had competitions to see how many people they could shoot through with a single shot. They would line up men, women, and children one after another and see how many people will these bullets pass through and they would compete to see who could kill the most people. They also would compete by um, having beheading contests where the officers would take their samurai swords and see who could get the cleanest cut. And then they would have their men do bayonetting practice on live human subjects where they would tie women and children up to trees and then have them bayoneted there. They raped the women, they killed the men. It was an absolutely terrible thing that they tried to cover, but the news will make it out of Nanking and will scare uh, the United States and will, will certainly convince us that something needs to be done, but the problem is are we ready for a war? Well, you might have recall from our previous video lecture that um, the United States was not ready for a war yet, that 70% of Americans were opposed to a war either in Europe or in Japan. And so the United States is going to start to get more and more information as time goes on about this situation um, in China and be appalled. Now, information that we won't get until later, uh, but will be exposed after the war again adds to the appalling nature of this thing and it's a, a group called unit 731 unit 731 was this absolutely disgusting despicable group of what people have called the devil's doctors and we're all familiar with the kinds of things that happened at auschwitz for instance the experimentation on human subjects and the death toll that took place there but i'm willing to bet that many of you are unaware of unit 731 and the terrible things that happened there so here's a little video to discuss what happened As you heard from the video that the doctors that were responsible for all of these terrible things like General Shiro Ishii uh, were planning to use this information that they were getting to perpetrate biological and chemical warfare against the United States, uh, which didn't work, it didn't end up happening. But at the same time, um, this information was vital after World War II and the United States, rather than trying these generals and, and putting these war criminals on trial for the, the to find justice, for the crimes that they had committed against humanity, uh, they decided that they were fearful that this information could get out to the Russians. And at that point in 1946, we're starting to in engage in the next phase of conflict, which is the Cold War. So American generals actually gave employment and protection to generals like uh, General Ishiro Ishii in order to get the information they wanted. And they used much of that information in their own um, research about chemical and biological warfare and human experimentation and medical technology. But at the time, some of the response from the Americans to try and, and slow the Japanese advance without provoking a war was to freeze Japan's assets in the United States to make it so that their, their banking um, was not taking place, their investments were no longer able to go back to the Japanese, and then also to create an oil embargo. They joined up with the Dutch, the French, and the English to create an embargo against Japan 
as a for, as a show of force to say, you know, we will cut off all trade with you if you continue in these practices. And and rather than preventing the war, what this really did was it angered Japan to the point where they uh, they called America a bunch of hypocrites and said, well, if you're going to do that to us, then there's a target on your back. At that point, while we w had been before not necessarily allies, but we'd been cooperative, especially in trade relations. Now Japan is going to uh, look for an opportunity to take out the United States in a single blow. Part of the reason that Japan is calling the United States a bunch of hypocrites is because they're looking at our own history in the United States with our, our manifest destiny, whether it be the deaths of tens of millions of Native Americans, whether intentionally or unintentionally through disease, or through intentional acts, acts of war that we had committed that were in indeed, in many ways, criminal. Like, for instance, you might recall that during the Spanish-American War, 200,000 Filipino citizens were killed in a guerrilla conflict trying to fight against the United States as we were trying to take over their island nation. And at one point, you may recall that the order went out from an American commander to kill everyone over 10 in order to try and prevent this, this uh, guerrilla warfare from taking place. And the Japanese know their history. They're looking at what the United States did. Many of the these Japanese um, commanders studied in the United States, went to American colleges and learned a lot of our darker stuff. And um, they are going to you know, say to the United States, you guys are hypocrites because we are doing simply the same things that you've done. Now, of course, we can look at it and say your experiments in Unit 731 are far worse than the kinds of things that we've done. But I'm just trying to give you a perspective on the two different sides and how that leads us to Pearl Harbor. So the, the attack at Pearl Harbor is going to happen because the United States was kind of reading the writing on the wall. And um, FDR uh, is going to send the fleet over from the eastern part of the United States over to uh Hawaii in preparation for what we think could be a war. Now again, he's not trying to provoke a war. He just wants uh, reasonable preparedness. And you heard uh, that after th the Rome-Berlin axis is going to form and then bring Japan into that axis in 1941, there's a lot of fear that this war is definitely going to come to our borders very soon. So we are preparing our fleet over there in the Pacific to get ready for this. Now, the Japanese know that, and so what the Japanese had planned to do was to attack um, on a Sunday at just after 7 in the morning at Pearl Harbor, but also to attack the islands of the Philippines, to attack Guam, to attack all of the strategic key points in the Pacific to make it so that in one huge attack that they would be able to annihilate the American forces and, and cripple our Navy, but at the same time provide them, if necessary, a launching pad to invade the United States itself. Now, the way in which they plan to do this is through the use of kamikaze pilots and Kairu submarines. These kamikaze bombers, remember that it means Godwind. They think that they are protecting their nation by doing this. These men had to fly about eight hours distance, and so that really only gives them enough fuel to take off from their aircraft carriers and then to fly all the way to Hawaii, and they had to do it in absolute radio silence. The way in which they're finding Hawaii is by listening to Honolulu ra radio stations and in targeting their planes or, or navigating their planes based upon the radio waves that they're hearing from Hawaii itself. So they will that those will lead them to the islands. And then once they go in for the attack, they really only have enough fuel in order to um, fly over the, uh, the naval base several times to make their attack runs. And then after they are about to run out of fuel or once they've used all of their ammunition, their goal is to fly directly into any targets that they can. Now the Kairu submarines are another method of doing the same kind of thing. Really, they only have enough fuel to get over to uh, the island of Hawaii and then make, perform their attack. And then after that, they're supposed to crash their submarine into the ships themselves. So there's a controversial theory that the United States might have known about this attack ahead of time. And there's certainly some evidence to indicate that we, we, we could have seen this thing coming. Um, the Japanese are planning this attack just after seven in the morning on a Sunday, knowing that many of our men will either be asleep or they will be at going to church. And so they will be much more vulnerable target that way. Um, but thankfully the U.S. had much of its fleet out on maneuver in order to keep prepping and practicing for the event of a war. 
But at the same time, there was very little indication to prove that for sure there was going to be an attack. We didn't know when it would happen. We didn't know where it would happen, but we knew an attack would happen at some point. This attack is going to be a well-coordinated thing that will hit not only Hawaii, but also the Philippines and Guam, essentially within just hours of each other. And there really was no way to get the news from one base to another, let alone to the president in time, to prevent anything from happening here. So we'll take a look now at a clip from the movie Pearl Harbor to help put it all in perspective. terrible day in American history. And honestly, we were very lucky in this occasion because it could have been so much worse. A good indication of that is that the Japanese were supposed to hit this area right here. That area is the, um, the oil for the entire naval fleet in the Pacific, and there's millions of gallons of oil there. And the theory is that had the Japanese hit that target the way that they were supposed to, then it would have crippled the U.S. fleet for maybe as much as another five years. Instead, what will happen is they will focus upon the ships and the planes, and what they will do is damage 18 of our 96 vessels or sink them, which is far less than they had hoped to be able to do. Certainly, um, it will be destructive to our air force as well that was prepared there. The 165 planes were destroyed in this attack. And then, of course, the loss of American lives is the most impactful part of this. The damage that the United States sustained at Pearl Harbor was so bad that the U.S. government didn't release the numbers until decades after because they were fearful that if made the, the knowledge public about the amount of losses we'd sustained, that the American people would simply want to give up the fight before it even began. So this is the most deadly attack on US soil until 9-11, and it killed 2,403 US sailors and 68 civilians that were on this base. The next day, December the 8th, 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will go before Congress and he will declare that December the 7th of 1941 is a date which will live in infamy. He will articulate how the United States was unjustifiably attacked with their naval and air force by the Empire of Japan. And then I love the quote where he says, always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Oh, what a beautiful quote, right? And, and certainly going to inspire Congress to vote in favor of a declaration of war. Now, you might recall that in our declaration of war in World War I was, uh, was certainly in favor of war, but at the same time had a lot of people that were dissenting in that decision. That's not the case here in World War II. There was, in fact, only one vote that was opposed in all of Congress, both the Senate and the House, only one vote that was opposed to war uh, in World War II. And that person was Jeanette Rankin. The female representative from Montana, the first female congressperson in American history, she was elected from Missoula, Montana, became a congressperson in World War I and voted no at that time. And then here she got reelected once again just before World War II, and she will end up again voting no on the war. Now, she broke down on the floor of Congress declaring that she wouldn't do it because she cannot send someone else to fight for her when she cannot fight herself in this war. So in a way, it's admirable, but at the same time, you can bet that a lot of people will not like her for it, and she definitely will not get reelected after that um, because of that decision. So on December the 9th, after the Congress passes a declaration of war against Japan, Germany is going to commit its second biggest blunder in Hitler's military history, okay? Their first biggest blunder was the invasion of Russia. You do not create a land war with Russia, okay? okay? Only the Mongols can do that and win. But uh, Napoleon tried it, uh, Hitler tried it, and neither one of them is going to be successful. So never fight a land war in Russia. That was his first biggest mistake. Second biggest mistake is to declare war on the United States of America because we truly are a sleeping giant that is about to awake. Now, Admiral Yamamoto is the man that gives us that intriguing quote. He was the one that planned the attack at Pearl Harbor. He was also the man in the movie clip that you saw earlier saying that uh, he is fearful about this attack. He is not sure if this is the right thing to do. In fact, he um, discussed this with the leaders of the, uh, the Navy and the military and the Emperor himself before the attack in, against Pearl Harbor because he thought that an invasion of the United States would be a bad idea because we have a 
gun hiding behind every blade of grass. Okay, well, that's an intriguing quote, and I really love it. But at the same time, uh, Admiral Yamamoto is right. This attack is going to wake a sleeping giant, and he's not the only one that sees that. In fact, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Great Britain was the only democracy left fighting against Hitler in Europe, and he, after hearing that the United States had been attacked, was actually happy about it. Not because of the loss of lives, not because of Americans getting killed, but he gives us a quote where he said, so he'd won after all. After 17 months of lonely fighting and 19 months of my responsibility and dire stress, we had won the war. England would live, Britain would live, the Commonwealth of Nations and the Empire would live. He also went on to say that the rest of this war, now that the United States is involved, will be a matter of the application of overwhelming force. So we'll take a look at that overwhelming force and how the war is going to progress in our next video. Thanks for watching.